give us your thoughts on 1984. I don't think you've ever really talked about that much. Okay. So I can't remember why I was thinking about 1984 recently. Um, but one, I think somebody had brought it up. It was something I was listening to and somebody brought up, you know, 1984. Not the Um, Van Halen album, the the novel by... Oh, you know, maybe that's what it was. You and I were talking about Van Halen and it just, you know, (laughs) went from there. A yarn, a yarn started in my mind. It's like, oh, Van Halen, 1984, George Orwell, you know. (laughs) So you've, you listened, you listened to references in the album to George Orwell's book? Is there any... Like is it is it like a sort of a, a I don't know I'm being silly. But, but the, like, well, the, yeah. the actual well the actual song 1984 on the Van Halen album, it's just a it's just a synth instrumental. Uh huh. Right. It's actually like retro wave before retro wave. Right. I need to add that to my playlist. That is yeah. yeah it is sort of retro pre retro wave retro wave. Yeah. So yeah, so that's what he was telling. That's that's the message of of that instrumental song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but but um, so I was thinking about 1984, and one of the things that's always bothered me, and I remember Marcus brought this up with you one time, um, and he was correct in this regard because I had actually thought about it at one point. I said, if 1984 is so anti the plan why was it so easily accessible in every high school uh that's a good question you know and so um because that's when i first read it even though i didn't really understand it it took me a you know a couple more reads throughout my lifetime to actually get what it was all about and i think for the most part like you know, even when you're very young and you, you know, watch something kind of dystopic or even just myopic or something, like you understand it, but you don't get that that's actually taking place in real life, right? Right. So, so why? So that that's one thing that always bothered me. It's like, well, I mean, 1984, the the they used to pass it out in like you know senior english like you had to, you had to do a book report on it it was either that or animal farm right and um same thing with brave new world um i remember people having copies of brave new world but it, you didn't have to do book reports on it i just remember it like being around but i never i never read it when i was in high school i i have this recollection of this guy telling me that brave new world was better than 1984 so I have that recollection. Um, but just that these books were, and, you know, we obviously know Brave New World is not some foretelling of the future to try to warn you. It's more of a blueprint to, kind of, you know, predict, predict, predictively program you, right? Yeah. Uh huh. So why would 1984 be any different? Because there's kind of this image of Orwell as like this benevolent kind of guy, right? Yeah, like he's uh, uh, sort of a man of the people that's trying to warn everybody. So it's interesting because, you know, if there's one person throughout uh, the time period that I did listen to him who poured over Orwell's stuff was Alan Watt. And I think even Alan Watt was having trouble, like, wrestling with the idea that Orwell was – either nefarious or benevolent benevolent he couldn't wrap his mind around it because i remember <clears throat> he was talking about how he was on this one episode it sticks out of my mind he was reading christopher hitchens biography of orwell and he said something alluding to that he had pretty much read every biography on orwell there is right mm-hmm. and and so i was i was thinking to myself like oh you know be, you know he's, he was saying something like you know people learn calling me in there asking if what you know what do i think of george orwell was he a good guy or was he in it you know and um and because i'm sure people wanted you know they want to know like well was he a good guy or a bad guy well here's the thing there's a very big point to orwell's 1984 that doesn't get touched on a lot it gets mixed it it gets completely and totally missed now i went and i looked at a bunch of different searches 
and I couldn't find anything on this subject. I couldn't find anybody pointing anything out about this. So I'm going to be the only person pointing this out that I know of. Okay. Okay. Now, the one thing that we take for granted with all of these books, especially fiction, and when you try to take a, fi- a work of fiction and you read it and, you, and it's been written, you know, this, you know, 1984 was written in 1947 and released in 1948. And then, you know, people down through history. Oh, you know, it just came to me why I was thinking about 1984, but I'll bring it up in a minute. Anyways, um, the reason, you know, it's written that far long ago, but, but the one thing you always hear down through history after a book is written is how prophetic it is or how relevant to the current time that it is, right? Mm-hmm. So you are you automatically go into a book with this kind of um, preconceived notion that this is going to be speaking to you. But the one thing that we take for granted when we have that kind of stuff already pre-programmed into us is that this book was written for a specific generation during a specific time period. Okay. Right. And the he, Cold War era. The Cold War era, but it was also being written at a particular time when there was a loosening up of morals and ideas about what people should be doing. And there's a specific part of that book that has always kind of bothered me because I could because it didn't understand. I'll, I'll give you an, another example and make my way back around to it. OK, so like you've seen they live a bunch of times, I'm guessing, right? Mm, yeah. OK, so there's one thing that's bothered me about they live. One of the program, what, remember, what, you know, you know, uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper's putting on the glasses and taking them off, and he can see the programming that's in the subliminal programming that's embedded into the uh, the billboards, right? Right. One of the subliminal programming is get married, have children, reproduce. Yeah. Right. Right. It's like, well, that's not really the the programming, is it? No, um, well, maybe that then again, too, what particular era, you know? Well, it, well, interestingly enough, by the time John Carpenter is making that comment, by the way, John Carpenter comes from kind of a outsider punk rock kind of, uh, you know, approach to uh, his filmmaking and, you know, kind of life in general, right? Mm-hmm. So even if, you know, he's telling you something that's, you know, overall good, if you want to, if people want to think of it that way, he's coming at it from a perspective of that by getting married and reproducing is conforming. It's conformity. Yeah. So it's sort of the punk rock take on how to buck against the system is that, yeah, you don't have families and you don't uh, marry and children all that have children. Yeah. So, so, so. That's that's pretty interesting. Um, can, you know, I'm sure that's bothered many people who've seen that in that film. Going, wait, what a minute, wait a minute. That's you know, what is he saying there? Um, and what he's taught, what he's trying to say there, you know, in the middle of the 1980s, when that movie came out is, or is it late 80s? Is that like 88 or something? Um, late 80s, I think. Yeah. So, you know, by this time, you already have a fracturing of society and a breaking off into individuals and all that type of stuff. So it's getting married and reproducing is definitely not a threat at this point. Um, uh, shoot. My, my parents' marriage was already coming apart by that time. Um, uh-huh. you've, so the, the other thing, so the thing in 1984 that's always bothered me is the part about the, the girl, I can't remember the girl's name. Um, the the feminazi and how he basically the message is that the system doesn't want him to have premarital or to have uh, they don't want them to have sex uh-huh. and he said he basically tells the girl and she understands but the he's narrating it throughout the book he's saying the way that you fight the system is by having sex 
Mm-hmm. Okay. We don't have kids. Yes, this is unproductive sex. So, he, you know, uh, if th- this is not a commentary on any modern mor- morals or anything like that, I'm not telling people this for uh, today's consumption. I'm speaking to a specific time period that has changed uh, life down through history as we know it, and we end up in the current conditions today. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in 1947, I think what he's doing is he's he's speaking to a generation of people that you know up and coming till we come into the 1960s, making its way into the 1960s, um, because that particular part of the book. Um, here's some of the quotes: "He's you know to re- to remove all pleasure from the sexual act, to kill the sex in- instinct, or if it cannot be killed, then to distort it and dirty it." It was not merely that the sex instinct created a world of its own, which was outside the party's control and which therefore had to be destroyed if possible. What was more important was that the sexual privation induced hysteria, which was desirable because it could be transformed into war fever and leader worship. When you make love, you're using up energy and afterwards you feel happy and you don't give a damn for anything. They can't bear you to feel like that. They want you to be bursting with energy all the time. All this marching up and down and cheering and waving flags is simply sex gone sour. If you're happy inside yourself, why should you get excited about Big Brother? Um, there's also, you know, there's also the uh, visions that he's having where he says. Uh, Vivid, beautiful hallucinations flash through his mind. He would flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He would tie her naked to a stake and shoot her full of arrows like St. Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Better than before, moreover, he realized why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty and sexless, because he wanted to go to bed with her, and he would never do so because round her sweet, supple waist, which seemed to ask you to encircle it with your arm... There was only the odious scarlet sash, aggressive symbol of chastity. Um, there's a part in the book where he talks about that the government gives porn to the uh, pro- to the proles, mm-hmm. and he says, uh, what, "What does he say? Uh, in order to keep them distracted, as ghastly, rubbish, boring, relying on just six plots, they simply swap around a bit." Um, He says, a man and a woman with no clothes on making love when they choose, talking of what they chose, not feeling any compulsion to get up, simply lying there and listening to peaceful sounds outside. Have you done this before? Of course, hundreds of times. Well, scores anyway. Listen, the more men you've had, the more I love you. Do you understand that? Yes, perfectly. You like doing this. I mean, I don't mean simply me. I mean the thing itself. I adore it. That was above all what he wanted to hear, not merely the love of one person, but the animal instinct, the simple undifferentiated desire that was the force that would tear the party to pieces. She only questioned the teachings of the party when they in some way touched upon her own life. I'm not interested in the next generation. I'm interested in us. And then he tells her, you're only a rebel from the waist down. Okay, so just right there, the idea that you see, this is this is speaking to the reader, and the and what he's telling the reader there is that you're going to bring down Big Brother and the, um, you know the system, the system, the Minority Report world that they exist in by having sex, not to procreate, but just. For the sake of having sex, because the sexual energy itself is what's going to, like he says, tear the party apart. Yeah. Just the and release you, of the energy in sex. Yeah, and it's interesting because because if you're thinking about the generation that comes up after that, and if you also think about Huxley, how that how that kind of that's what the world in Huxley in Huxley's work kind of exists around that, right? Right. It's sort of the government doesn't put restrictions on sex. It's actually the opposite, or it's, like, encouraged. There is even, like, a passage in there that talks about children running around naked, so it's kind of, like, implied that maybe even children, 
there's even pedophilia going on maybe oh that's what the the children go to school to watch porn they're like watching porn at school yeah and yeah, they're, that, called, yeah. they're called the movies are called the feelies is it like cartoon porn or something like that i was trying to re- i was trying to remember what was in there yeah but so 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 i think personally that the what orwell is kind of saying here and i would postulate speculate that maybe the whole point of the book is to tie this idea that if you want to get rid of, you know, uh, tyrannical dictatorship governments like Stalin, we, because, you know, allegedly this book kind of revolves, you know, it's written around the time period. The, the way the story goes, if, you know, I'm remembering it correctly, is someone like Orwell, he felt betrayed by Stalin, mm-hmm. right? He was a socialist. He, he was a socialist. And then once the socialists come, once the communists took over in Spain and once Stalin took over in Russia, uh, he, you know, like I said, allegedly the story goes, he just realized that, oh, wow, we're just as brutal as the capitalists. Right. Right. Did, he wrote other books. Right. And then he was uh, sort of known as this sort of. Uh being being a critic of uh, socialism, it was another book. It's something about uh, something bridge or something, and it's uh, it's a it's the whole thing is sort of a critique on socialism, and that's kind of was his whole angle as a writer, from what I understand. But right, and he's he's an interesting guy. De- most definitely, he definitely is. He's definitely an intelligence officer, and that's admitted. Right, that's not. Um, yeah, he's for, yeah, he's fulfilling and he's fulfilling some sort of cultural role. Mm-hmm. So you know whether he was trying to do good or trying to do bad is kind of neither here nor there. Whatever it was, his particular role was, and whoever it was was kind of furthering him down this particular path. Um, there's also conspiracy theories out there that the that the government had him you know killed. Because he was writing 1984, which I don't believe that. But um, um, well, it's interesting too that you're bringing all this stuff up. Is that okay? So you, in literature, you have these two bodies of work that are referenced frequently in our culture, which would be Brave New World and, and George Orwell 1984. The what you're talking about here with the uh, the way sex is betrayed in this these different uh dystopias or totalitarian type systems uh is actually sort of opposite right where you have in in brave new world it's sort of encouraged but then it's like doesn't there it doesn't result in reproduction in 1984 it's re, it's suppressed so you're not even permitted to have sexual relations in the in the uh, upper party, the uh, party members. Yes, and so, <clears throat> so an interesting part about this. One thing I was pondering on. This is getting around to where I initially was thinking about 1984 in general. Was the role that 1984 and Brave New World play in politics in general, and. They, those two books themselves play a particular role, and you don't even really have to read them. They just kind of play a kind of background, like reference. Someone can always reference, oh, well, that's because we're moving into a brave new world. Oh, that's because this, is, this country's turning into a 1984 situation, right? Mm-hmm. Now, here's the interesting thing. Do you remember this? You could look this up. You could go ahead and look this up. I I I recall this. Um, okay, do you remember that the Queen of England gave a brand new, unused first edition copy of 1984 to Jose Barroso as a gift? Oh, this is a while back, right? <clears throat> yeah, he was the uh, yeah, head. I of, remember. He, he was the head of the EU at the time. He was like the first president of the EU or whatever. When it just you know when they started you know that's it, been around for. 60 years or whatever, but whenever they first started calling it the EU or whatever, um, 
I think it was Jose Barroso, the, the, he was also the president of Spain. And he, um, and the Queen of England gave him a first edition brand new copy of 1984 as a gift. Mm, okay. And it's like, why would she do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, so here's another thing. This is what, what I was saying is, um, so liberals, liberals are um, flocking to Amazon and to booksellers all over the place and picking up copies of 1984. So the media says, because oh, yeah, Trump... right. Forgot about that. Because Trump is going to it's going to be like 1984 now do you remember that same exact story when obama got in office well it was the same thing where people were going buying copies of 1984 because of barack obama mm -hmm. yep mm. republicans i might have missed that i don't know if i no i don't remember that and you can even go look it up under bush <laughs> okay and um People were buying them under Nixon, and the hippies were all into 1984 because Nixon was the epitome of 1984. What about Carter? He wasn't that threatening, I don't think. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing nobody. They had a lull in the, in the purchasing there. I'm a simple Carter. Me at Palma. I don't. No, I don't no, no. Home. Remember. Well, actually, actually, Carter. Remember, he was a trilateral. He's like the first trilateral president because the, the, he was the first president to actually be in office when the trilateral commission existed. So you know, he had the big Nabrzinski and Cyrus Vance and all those guys who were in David Rockefeller's trilateral commission. So it was the end of the world under Carter too. Uh, Reagan, of course, you know, the, everybody bought a copy in 1984 under Reagan. Um, so this is a regularly occurring thing. At least it's reported in the news. Now, do you think this really happens? People no, get I don't. spurred to go buy copies in 1984. I don't. I. But here, here's and here's another giveaway. Why? Do you remember when they asked Hillary Clinton what her two, what her favorite book is, and she said, "I have two favorite books: Brave New World and 1984." Remember that? <laughs> she said that for real. <laughs> no, no. Go, wait. go, go! Find that clip and splice that into the call. I, I think you're just now making shit up, John. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> really? What? Okay. Was this when Clinton was president? What? Uh, Bill? No, no. This was um, when she was running against Obama. Ah. Maybe Judd Apatow's right. She doesn't have any kind of self-awareness whatsoever when she blurts stuff out. <laughs> uh, yeah, the um, so that's kind of my personal take on 1984. There is I can you know, like I said, that was one thing that always bothered me. And then I started to think about it. I'm all, oh, okay. This book was written in a particular time period for a particular generation. The problem is, is we always read something with the pre with the preconceived notion that this is going to be speaking to me in my current situation, my current time period. And then you never think about like, Oh wait, no, this is actually it looks speaking. Like a former oh, excuse me. Oh yeah. Uh, this is actually speaking to the people of the generation that, you know, is going to read it in the next 10 years when it was written or whatever, which, you know, when they get to that part about the, you know, sexual revolution, which that's basically what he's kind of saying. He's saying the way to revolution against the party is to have sex, sexual revolution. Well, boom, there you go. That makes sense, yes. And then sort of a limited hangout. I guess that's a, where you have truths revealed, and they and it's sort of a, a, a classic work in that it speaks a lot of truth. So it kind of stands the test of time, especially when you see just it, the news brings it up a lot too. Just they'll they'll say Big Brother, oh Big Brother is here. Uh, they're going to be surveillance up your rear, all this other stuff, you know. Like the, the, there's frequent references to Big Brother, so it's sort of this cultural uh, go-to for anything dystopian or or totalitarian or whatever so it's 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 put out there as sort of a 
it's like a reference. It's like a cultural reference so that people, um, it's, well, you know, it's very interesting as far as how this actually works. It's always coming to that, but it's, and, you know, there's not really, it, you know, it's like this. It's like, it's always getting to that point, but it's never getting to that point. Um, and it's here, some, but it's not. It's it's here, but it's not. Uh, Br- you know, Brave New World is often referenced. Like you, you'll you'll be watching like you know, transhumanists give uh, TED talks or something like you know something similar to what you posted up there on the website, right? Yeah. And they'll say something like that. Oh well, this isn't quite the Brave New World scenario you thought it was going to be, <laughs> right? Oh no, no. There's always you know there's always something like that. Like oh. You know, it's it's always used as kind of something like, oh, it's not as terrible as, you know, as Huxley made it out to be, is it? But yet we're here, aren't we? Right? Yeah, it's not so bad. Well, here's the thing, too. So you can read the book 1984, and then within it, it's like this guy, Winston Smith. He's living in a totalitarian, under a totalitarian regime. He gets tortured. He gets uh put through the ringer and the system and all that. Um, you have people right now <laughs> that are rotting in jail that haven't really done anything uh, to be deserving of uh, the, the prison sentence and the kind of treatment that they get in prison. And it's like, well, you know, it's not me. So it's almost like, well, so how are you supposed to interpret these things about dystopias or whatever? It, you know, regardless, it's like it, it's something that has to impact you directly before you would recognize, hey, this is fascism or totalitarianism or this is an oppressive system, or whatever. That's always been the case. And like I always say, too, it's like government, it doesn't exist. It's something that's it's 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 an, it's a, a conceptual like abstraction. It's not it's not real. You know, it's like we've reify it we put you know it, we pretend as if it's real like our actual thing but it's not so in order for it it's so the way i look at this stuff too is that in order for it to even exist or to be resonant or to be something that impacts us it has to be extreme in some areas you see what i'm saying so that there's this constant push pull this constant dialectic that's always continually underway. And this has always been the case when it comes to government, I believe, that it's like there's always a boogeyman to fight. There's always these disputes and conflicts within the system itself so that things can be pointed to and then it can be pointed out that this is out of line, but this over here is normal. But like both side, both conditions are wrong, bad, ridiculous, unacceptable, arbitrary, but you can take the extreme example, contrast it against the not so extreme example, and then um, it's just something that I, on the calls too, I try to wrap my mind around, I try to articulate this stuff and it's some, it's some kind of difficult to do. It's like, uh, but it, for some reason this is recalling when I was uh, talking about uh, the whole transsexual thing and I was trying to illustrate the point by claiming to be LeBron James. And I'm not really Le- LeBron James, but I identify as LeBron James. So therefore, I actually am LeBron James. But then to later on the next episode, on the next call, claim to be Kevin Durant. And then people will say, hey, you said you were LeBron James. I said, no, no, I never did say that. I always, always said I was Kevin Durant. That becomes the debate. You see what I'm saying? Absolutely. I know I've, well, I've, I've kind of this kind of convoluted, but I think it it's fitting in that it goes back to like un, your unexamined premise is like the whole thing with government and the dialectic, and then you know we could look at 1984, we can look at Brave New World, we can see like oh these are uh, extreme examples given. At the well, same time, it lends legitimacy to the corrupt, arbitrary system that we're in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does. It, it yeah. And another another thing to go along with that is, remember that you saw that clip that uh, Tim Kelly sent sent us of the protesters in Phoenix. Oh yeah, I didn't really. I, I watched that. I, I really didn't know what the uh, what, what the implication what he's pointing out. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, Tim Tim was pointing out, he said, do you think this is staged? Because look at the jersey that the guy was wearing who came and grabbed the guy up off the ground. And he was wearing the jersey of that football player who, I, I still can't remember the guy's name, the football player who wouldn't, you know, uh, do the national anthem or whatever. Oh, I miss that. No, I, I totally miss that. I just watched it and I just clicked the link and so yeah, that's what it so, was. Okay. So, yeah, he just happens, of all the people he could, whose jersey he could be wearing, he's wearing that that guy's jersey, <laughs> right? And it's so, – so, yeah, that was a good catch there, uh, Tim. Um, oh, yeah, that's a sharp eye there. Yeah, I, I – but, but, yeah. but here's the thing. But here's the thing that struck me about the video altogether. I was looking at the comments and all this type of stuff, and it's um, – and so here's what, what most of the comments were. It's, um, you know, the – Good. I'm glad the cops are are kicking those commies' ass. Communists are faggots. We need to those police. Those police should have shot them instead of beat them up, right? <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, ten years ago when Bush was in office or Obama, the cops were bad, and they were 1984 militarized police fascists who were coming to steal your rights, right? But because we've got all this race stuff stirring and we've got this, you know, le radical left versus radical right stuff all stirred up, now everybody cheers the cops. See, the cops are good when the cops come and bash the right-wingers, but the cops are also good when they bash the left-wingers. According See? to the right, they're good when they're cracking commie heads. That's right. Like, so, Oh, that's great. Love to see so, that, but, yeah. But, but you know what gets lost in all of this is should we have goon squad militarized police in black uniforms? Like like Alex Jones used to say back in the day, you know, I don't I don't want some thug coming up with his boots and making me lick his boots with his black uniform on with a billy club saying, Lick my boots, punk. Was he saying that's bad? Yeah, he was saying that's bad back then. He did he's saying he didn't like that. But now it's yeah. uh it's it's oh yeah, good thing we have them because the because the red Cause, diaper doper you know, babies are getting out of control. Yeah, anti anti -fa, anti fascists are you know are you know beating up right wingers. So and, and so so the interesting part about all this is is we have these two books, which once again, like I was saying before. Um, no matter what gener you know, what uh, presidency you're in, what particular um, manifestation of government you're in, you have these books that you can kind of look to and get an idea. Like you, like you were making the point, you have these books as kind of a reference point as to what, like, the darkest, most, you know, worst part of a tyranny is going to look like, or what it could be. Right. Right. You have this kind of reference. Oh, this is what it is. Okay. Well, here, here's the other thing. Um, I don't know what it is about 1984. Um, it wasn't so much this way with Brave New World. Um, I don't. I don't think Huxley is as good of a writer as Orwell is. Um, 1984. The first time I read it back in high school, I didn't even really understand it all that much, so it was kind of over my head. The second, third, and fourth time I read 1984, it is a super depressing book so be very careful reading that book mm -hmm. if, anybody, yeah, it is. if anybody's gonna, gonna read it because orwell is a really gifted lingu linguist and um there may be something to that too i don't even know if that's some sort of thing because everybody i've ever talked to who's actually read 1984 has pretty much said the same thing like like you know whoa that book's heavy that's some deep stuff you know mm -hmm. yeah and uh, it's really depressing. So uh, it's uh, yeah, just be careful reading that. And it's uh, if there's any high school students out there who are you know reading that book, um, it, you know don't worry. Don't worry. That's you know not going to take place within your lifetime. Probably, probably not. Probably. Well, here's the thing too. It's like so he's he's I think he's actually referencing things that took place under. You know Stalin under these different regimes, uh, but the thing is too is that uh, the the oppressive nature of 
this thing called government. It's just that you have these people identified as government, and then they have all this uh, power by way of just simply the fact that they're, you know, like a cult belief. They they have weapons, and they can enforce their laws on, you know, everybody else around them. And it's always has been the case, and it, it, as long as there's government, it always will be the case that you could end up on the on the wrong end of the stick. But it's not. But the but the thing about it, it's that it is um, not likely because they're always outnumbered like to a huge extreme. You know, there. But there's like always these examples given. So you can take make an example of somebody and put it in a book or put it on television or put it in a paper or something like that. And so that's sort of a cautionary tale that's like, oh, you don't want to run afoul of the man. But then on the flip side of that, uh, there's a book that's been referenced a couple of times. I need to go check it out. And it's about a, it, it, this guy's making this, I think, a really excellent point from what I understand. The gist of this book is that uh, it's always been people who've sort of been scoff laws throughout the ages that are that we have to think for the degree of freedom that we do have just people that would not conform or comply to the system. And he gives all different kinds of examples of how, you know, they, they had laws and that did people refuse to obey. So they had to change them, uh, stuff like that. There's, there's, I, th- I think that's always has been the case with, with, uh, so-called government and there's always been abuses and, um, and I'm sure there's people who've been tortured in jail. There's been people that, you know, that you're not going to hear about. There's been people, plenty of people beat to death in jail. Uh, that happens, I believe it happens fairly regularly. Uh, that it is just a, uh, it's just a, just a consequence of having, you know, these, these unchecked, unchecked power, you know, to, to, to any one degree or another, it's, it's always going to be the case. But it's 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 mostly fictional, you know. It's 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 mostly f- it, the the specter of the this overbearing oppressive government is just. I, I don't care what regime you're talking about or well, what. It's always been like it's, a. It's always been. It's a like fiction. a lot of the security. You know, it's like we we've talked about this before, and um, you know, a lot of the security everywhere is just theater too. I mean, even some even some of your local department stores. Just, just saying, I'm not saying do anything. You know, I'm not saying you know, but some of your local department stores, those those uh, detectors at the front for the um, for the price tags. Uh huh. They those those don't actually uh, read the price tags, and it's not going to beep if you walk up the door with uh, stuff. Not that I know firsthand or anything, <laughs> but. But um, it's the same with some of the stuff at the airports. It's all theater. It's all fiction. It's all yeah, perception management and yeah. Same. It's it's yeah. like um, Adam Curry was saying on one of the No Agendas because you know he's a traveler. He um, he was saying how you know like when they ask for your thumbprint with the with the fast check or whatever the the line that gets you through quicker because you've got you've been pre checked. Like the pre-check isn't even connected to anything with your information, you know? No, oh, really? Okay, yeah, yeah. So it's just it's all just yeah, for show, yeah. It's all it's complete. It's complete theater. It's it's basically you're paying you're paying extra money to go through this pre-check line just to basically get through the line faster, but there is no actual real security. I think that that is a microcosm. It's just like I think that's the the ideal of government in a nutshell, right there. Like why we could take that example and we can say, well, that's just uh, an example of where the system breaks down. I say no, that's an example of how the system actually works across the board. It's all that to one extent or another. It's all theater. It's all perception management. Um, I, I personally, I don't believe there's anything to fear from the quote unquote government. Uh, they always could snatch you up at any time, but then again, too, so could a criminal gang, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's just kind of the luck of the draw or whatever people that end up 
uh, you know, uh, oppressed or what w- or what have you. But uh, it largely, mostly, in, in in its essence, is just a uh, mind game, mind tricks, and uh, it's very effective though, because the perception is created and people will for the most part stay in line you know yeah i agree and i think too like we've talked about before is like there's different things that have been allowed to exist throughout societies uh one you know as laboratories but also as kind of um as kind of things you don't want to ever happen so it's like communism existed in the cold war during to the u.s because you know, it helped keep everybody in line because that's what you would never want to happen, right? Right. And it's the same thing like we were talking about the other day with slavery. It's like slavery is something, it's like you never want to go back to that. <laughs> the way that it's depicted in... The way that it's the, positioned. Yeah, it's yeah. positioned as like, well, yeah, this is freedom. What you currently now have is freedom. And that other thing back then, that was slavery and that what you have now is not slavery because that's what slavery is, that thing over there. Well, there was this article, I think, that came out. I, I can't recall where it's from, but they were talking about how people that were slaves liked being slaves, or they gave examples where people like uh, under the traditional form of slavery that everybody's feeling. They, they liked being slaves. Um it, but then now, it's, you know, of course, that's uh, anathema. That's outrageous. That's ridiculous. How could you say that? It's like, well, if you think it through, there probably was plantation situations where, you know, you have, okay, you're there on the plantation. What are you going to do? You're going to work. You got nothing else to do. The The conditions aren't so bad. Maybe you got a nice cot, a pretty decent cottage. It's, you know, you can keep your stuff clean. You can kind of... You go work. The work's not too hard. You don't got the guy out there with a the whip. He's not a hard ass. He's just, yeah, and everybody's kind of like on friendly first name terms. I could totally see that happening in the South or whatever. It's just, that, and then and you maybe find other examples where it was extreme. Um, so then, with the, which is the, the paradox there, you could have a, you can have circumstances that where you could probably go back in time and find slaves you know uh, under the there, under definition that we're better off than like a lot of people that work minimum wage jobs today or they're just like mm-hmm. struggling and they can't even pay bills you know you know there's a quote from alex haley when uh there's a there's a famous quote from alex haley about making up the whole whip thing with roots like people mostly get the idea of slaves being whipped to not being you know whipped into bloody frenzy and not being able to stand up um yeah. from roots from the tv series roots and alex haley says he basically made it up to make a point right he said that it's not he he admitted it's not historically accurate that that happened and um i'm not saying that you know nobody ever got whipped ever but why would you whip your property to where the point where they can't work yeah yeah and then the most likely circumstance was that it was um that the, they were kept in line by just pure economics just kind of per, and then perception management and like oh well, you know you, you run away you'll get whipped or, or, or you know where are you going to run away to i mean you got a job you got a a farm and it's like producing and you got you got plenty to eat you got um you know what what are the real discernible uh, real world difference between that and somebody that's on a corporate plantation today uh it's yeah it's just it's like uh um, they they give you things in history to never go back to and to make you believe that what you currently now is the best it's ever going to be right it's like you wouldn't want to get rid of capitalism because that would mean it would be communism, right? So well, we don't have the two minutes of hate. They don't like stop everybody at work and have you go into the telescreen and shout angry epithets at the telescreen, do they? So we're not no. in 1984, are we? But the metaphor there is um, for, you know, 
but see, here, here's the thing, because that could be open to interpretation to another generation. Someone might be able to take that reading it in current today and then say there's people yelling at, at their television screens at Trump right now. That means 1984 is happening. Well, they're right. Mm-hmm. But, but it's not something that's a, you know, obligatory. It's not something that's mandatory, but it's effectively the same thing in, mm-hmm. in a lot of respects. So they are right in that observation. They are correct in that observation, but um, it, 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 it's like where, yeah, what you're talking about is something that, oh, we don't want to go to this or we don't want to go back to this. It's, it's just sort of this reference point. And because it's not directly across the board relatable to the fictional account, then people don't see it as uh, for what it is, which is, you know, it's perception management. It's 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 manipulative. Uh, it's it's theater. Because like in, in 1984, there wasn't a Goldstein. He didn't exist. And Winston finds that out. He's like, oh, you know, that's a spoiler alert there. Uh, if you haven't. Oh, that's quote. because Goldstein is Osama bin Laden. He could be Osama bin Laden. He could be Trump. Yeah. He could be uh, Ro- Robert Reich or wh- whoever you, <laughs> <laughs> you love to hate. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I got to go. I know you have to go too. So, but, um, but uh, yeah, good talk. Yeah, good talk, man. Cool. Thanks for coming yeah, on uh, for uh, sharing your thoughts on uh, on the state of affairs. Yeah, I think it was a good call. Cool. Cool. All right, I'll talk. I'll talk to you later, my friend. All right, my friend. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.